Hello and welcome to News News live from Istanbul. I'm Jawad Tehami and these are the headlines. Pakistan has called on the UN Security Council to urge India to lift the military siege in occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Foreign Office spokesperson Zahid Hafiz Chaudhary was speaking at a weekly news briefing in Islamabad. He said Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi urged the council to call on Delhi to release jailed Kashmiri politicians. Three hundred MPs from Myanmar have urged the UN to probe rights abuses by the military following the last week's coup. In a letter, they say the coup leaders have restricted freedom of speech by controlling internet access. Earlier, the UN Rights Office said the Security Council should consider sanctions on Myanmar for violence against civilians. Lebanon's Prime Minister-designate Saad al-Hariri says no progress has been made in talks to form a new government. He was speaking to reporters in Beirut after his first meeting with the Lebanese President Michel Aoun in weeks. Lebanon hasn't been able to form a new government since Prime Minister Hassan Diab resigned following the Beirut explosion last year. France, Germany and Britain have called on Iran to stop all activities that violate the 2015 nuclear deal. In a joint statement, the three powers said Iran has no justification for producing uranium metal in violation of the accord. Pakistan has approved China's can sino bio vaccine for emergency use against COVID-19. The country has already approved Chinese Sinopharm and Oxford's AstraZeneca vaccines. Pakistan registered 33 more fatalities overnight, raising the death toll past 12,000. Globally, the virus has claimed 2.37 million lives and infected over 107 million people. And in the Australian Open, Serbia's world number one, Novak Djokovic, beats American Taylor Fritz by three sets to two. With this win, the top seed has booked his place into the fourth round of the Grand Slam. Those were the headlines and detailed stories right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. And now for the news in detail. Pakistan has called on the UN Security Council to urge India to lift the military siege in occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Foreign Office spokesperson Zahid Hafiz Chaudhary was speaking at a weekly news briefing in Islamabad. He said Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi has urged the council to call on Delhi to release jailed Kashmiri politicians. The spokesperson slammed the extrajudicial killings of Kashmiris in fake encounters and staged cordon and search operations. He said India is violating all humanitarian norms by refusing to hand over even the bodies of Kashmiri martyrs to their families. He said India's state sponsorship of terrorism and its global disinformation campaign against Pakistan have been exposed. Highlighting the importance of multinational maritime exercise UMN, he said the exercise will help foster a shared vision for maritime security in the region. The army has killed four terrorists while thwarting a raid on a post in the northern Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province. The military's media wing says four Pakistani soldiers embraced martyrdom during the encounter in South Waziristan district. Those martyred include Lance Naik Imran Ali, Sipoy Atif Jahangir, Sipoy Anisur Rahman and Sipoy Aziz. The military says sanitization of the area is underway. Earlier on February 3rd, security forces killed four terrorists during an operation in North Waziristan district. Pakistan's Army Chief General Kamar Javed Bajwa and British envoy to Pakistan Dr. Christian Turner have discussed the Afghan peace process. The meeting was held at the General Headquarters in Rawalpindi. The two also exchanged views on matters of mutual interest. 
The Army chief thanked the UK's support for Pakistan in its fight against COVID-19. Several residents gathered in the Canadian city of Regina in solidarity with the farmers protesting in India. They urged Ottawa to speak out against the human rights violations during the demonstrations in India. Meanwhile, Congress leader Rahul Gandhi is going on a tour of Rajasthan today where he will address a rally of farmers. This comes as the farmer unions announced to intensify the movement in the coming days. A grand meeting and a public rally will be held in Maharashtra on February 20. The farmers have been at borders of Delhi for 77 days, demanding the rollback of laws they say will jeopardize their livelihoods. More than 200 protesting farmers have died during the demonstrations, including four who committed suicide. 300 MPs from Myanmar have urged the UN to probe rights abuses by the military following the last week's coup. In a letter, they say the coup leaders have restricted freedom of speech by controlling internet access. Earlier, the UN Rights Office said the Security Council must consider sanctions on Myanmar for violence against civilians. It said at least 350 people have been arrested during demonstrations since the coup on February the 1st. The United States has already imposed sanctions on Myanmar's military rulers. The coup leaders say they will return power after holding fresh polls once the one-year state of emergency ends. And for more on this, uh, we have uh, Simon Billiness, a human rights activist from Washington, D.C. Simon, thank you for your time at Indus News. There are reports that security forces are using violent methods to curb the protests against the coup. Don't you think using force will fan more resentment? I mean, certainly, if the military uses force on these uh, peaceful pro-democracy uh, protests, uh, I think that is likely just to make uh, the, uh, the resentment and, uh, and the cause grow. I mean, we're at a very pivotal point right now. And, you know, what we're doing um, at the, uh, the International Campaign for the Rohingya, and also No Business with Genocide, is that we're doing everything we possibly can to support civil society inside Burma and to particularly support the young people who are on the streets right now calling for an end to military rule. And uh, the, uh, the call has come up to boycott and sanction the Myanmar military for this coup. The call has come up to go after Myanmar military-owned companies. And we're doing everything we can to get um, the global business community to boycott and end all business relationships with Myanmar military and companies. And we're also lobbying our governments to place sanctions on the Myanmar military officials and again on, on Myanmar military owned companies. Simon, after the US sanctions, now the UN human rights body has also called for the curbs on the military uh, rulers. How effective do you think it could be for the restoration of democracy over there in Myanmar? These sanctions can be very effective. Uh, history has proved that when the Myanmar military is under sanctions, their behavior improves. And when the Myanmar military is not under sanctions, that's when they believe they can act with impunity, and that's when they commit uh, the worst human rights abuses. And so, you know, we saw that in August 2017. After the U.S. dropped all sanctions on the Myanmar military, in, in at the end of 2016, then the Myanmar military felt completely uh, free to launch that campaign of genocide against the Rohingya. And so, you know, history has proved that sanctions work with the Myanmar military. They understand political pressure and they understand economic pressure. And that's the pressure that the international community needs to exert right now to stop, if we can, the military from using force against the, uh, the, uh, the youth on the streets in Myanmar right now. So, uh, Simon, you have alluded to a very important fact that whenever there are no sanctions, Myanmar's military acts with impunity. So hasn't the military rulers over there learned lessons from the past? We, we, we need to ensure 
that this military coup is met with an appropriate response, and that is sanctions on the Myanmar military for having, for having conducted this military coup. The United States government has called this a coup. The United States government has sanctioned top military leaders and a number of Myanmar military-owned companies. That's a very good first step. We need other countries to follow suit. We also need the U.S. government, whether it be the administration or Congress, to uh, ramp up these sanctions and, in particular, sanction Myanmar military-owned conglomerates, uh, MEHL and MEC. Um, you know, the Myanmar military has to understand that uh, any violence by them on the Myanmar people protesting peacefully in the streets, any act of violence will be met with a response by the international community that will sanction them, sanction their business interests, sanction their families, and, uh, and uh, put, you know, enough political and economic force that uh, we get the military to back off. Okay, uh, Simon, people from all of walks of life are joining the protests, including doctors and police as well. So is there any possibility that uh, personnel from within the military ranks could rise against the coup also? I mean, I think we're seeing is that members of the police and members of the army who are from the same communities as the protesters are much less, li much less likely to uh, uh, obey orders to, to shoot and kill their own neighbors. Um, what we've seen in the past is when the Burmese military wants to crack down on protests in Rangoon and in Mandalay, they bring in troops from outside of those communities who don't have those community ties. And we're, we're very worried. Uh, we're looking for any possible deployment of troops from Rakhine State or Kachin State or Karen State into the capital, uh, Naypyidaw, and into major cities like Mandalay and Rangoon. If we see that, that could be a uh, uh, that could presage a uh, a violent crackdown by the military. So we've got to look out for that. But you know, I do expect to see defections from the military, from the police, uh, and just you know, general civil disobedience from soldiers. You know. You know, in, in the past, demonstrators have urged soldiers that if they're told to fire, that they just simply cock their rifle up and fire over the people's heads instead, things like that. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, very tense situation. We are at the risk of, of serious violence by the military against the Myanmar people protesting on the streets. And, you know, this is why the international community needs to act, needs to act now to make it very clear to the Myanmar military that uh, this far and no further. Simon Abilines, a human rights activist from Washington, D.C., Thank you very much for your time at Indus News and we really appreciate that. Now moving on, France, Germany and Britain have called on Iran to stop all activities that violate the 2015 nuclear deal. In a joint statement, the three European powers condemned the Iran's decision to produce uranium metal. They also told Iran that his, it has no justification for breaching the accord. The deal aims to provide a gradual lifting of sanctions against Iran in exchange for Tehran's commitment that it will not seek a nuclear weapon. But the agreement has been crumbling since Washington's unilateral withdrawal in 2018. The European Parliament has called on member states to ban arms sale to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. A joint motion adopted by the Parliament called for holding all the perpetrators of human rights violations in Yemen to account. It called for the EU global human rights sanctions regime to be deployed to impose targeted sanctions. The motion also recalled Germany's ban on arms sales to Saudi Arabia and Italy's ban to the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Brussels also welcomed Washington's decision to halt arms sales to Riyadh and to suspend the transfer of F-35 jets to Abu Dhabi. Lawmakers said some other European countries are also planning to join the ban. The UN has warned at least 400,000 Yemeni children under five may die of starvation this year without urgent intervention. According to a report by UN agencies, there is 22% increase in acute malnutrition among children under five as compared to last year. The warnings 
come nearly six years after the outbreak of war left 80 percent of the population surviving on humanitarian aid. As per the report, Aden, Hodeida, Taiz and capital Sana are among the worst hit cities. In a joint statement, the World Food Programme and the WHO said another 2.3 million under five will suffer acute malnutrition in 2021. The UN says the Arab country is the world's largest humanitarian crisis. More stories to follow right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Turkey says it will not back down from its purchase of Russian S-400 defense systems despite U.S. sanctions. In an interview, a presidential spokesperson said Ankara wants to dissolve issues with NATO allies through dialogue. Ibrahim Kalin warned against any expectations of a quick solution to the issue. He asserted that advances can be made if the parties read the strategic picture the right way. Kalim also called on the U.S. to end support of a Kurdish militia that Ankara has designated as a terrorist group. Earlier, U.S. State Department spokesperson Ned Price urged Turkey not to retain the purchase. Lebanon's Prime Minister-designate Saad al-Hariri says no progress has been made in talks to form a new government. He was speaking to reporters in Beirut after his first meeting with the Lebanese President Michel on in weeks. Hariri earlier met with French President Emmanuel Macron, who is pushing Lebanese leaders to form a new government and tackle their country's financial crisis. Lebanon hasn't been able to form a new government since Prime Minister Hassan Diab resigned following the Beirut explosion last year. More than 200 people were killed in the blast. U.S. President Joe Biden has extended the national emergency for Libya by another year. Biden says the crisis remains an unusual and extraordinary threat to the U.S. national security and foreign policy. In an executive order, he said the foregoing circumstances and prolonged attacks have worsened the security situation. The U.S. president said measures are needed to protect against the diversion of Libyan state assets. Washington first declared emergency for Libya in early 2011 during Muammar Gaddafi's government. The U.S. accused Gaddafi's regime of using violence against civilians and misappropriating Libyan state assets. Russia says it is ready to cut ties with the European Union if the bloc hits Moscow with economic sanctions. In an interview, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said if one wants peace, one must prepare for war. He said Moscow should be self-reliant in its economic sector to minimize the effect of potential EU sanctions. EU foreign ministers are set to meet soon to decide upon curbs against Moscow over the arrest of Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny. Meanwhile, Navalny has once again returned to court over another trial on slender charges. He stands accused of defaming a Russian World War II veteran who took part in a promotional video backing constitutional reforms last year. Australia's second most popular state of Victoria has entered a five-day lockdown again after a new COVID-19 clustered outbreak. Mexico has reported 10,000 new cases and more than 1,400 fatalities overnight. The nationwide death toll has exceeded 171,000. Globally, the virus has claimed 2.36 million lives and infected over 107 million people. What in this report? The fight against COVID-19 is getting more complicated by the day. Brazilian officials say the variant identified in the country's Amazon region can be three times more contagious than the previous ones. Meanwhile, indigenous leaders have warned of evangelical missionaries turning Amazon villages against COVID-19 vaccines. In the United States, an official panel of experts examining the previous administration's pandemic policies says 40 percent of the deaths from COVID-19 could have been averted. President Joe Biden also slammed the Trump administration for not ordering enough doses and mobilizing people to administer vaccines. It's no secret that the vaccination program was in much worse shape than my team and I anticipated. We were under the impression and been told that we had a lot more resources than we did when we came into office. While scientists did their job in discovering vaccines in record time, my predecessor 
be very blunt about it, did not do his job in getting ready for the massive challenge of vaccinating hundreds of millions of Americans. British-Swedish biopharmaceutical company AstraZeneca says production of vaccine against the new COVID-19 variants can take six to nine months. However, people who have received two doses of the Pfizer vaccine showed strong immune responses against the Kent and South African variants. South Africa is set to start vaccinating millions against the local variant with the Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson vaccines. New Zealand will also start vaccinations for border staff from next Saturday. This morning, I can confirm that New Zealand's first batch of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine is set to arrive in New Zealand next week, well within our scheduled time frame and ahead of previous expectations. That means we should be in a position, all things going to plan, to start vaccinating our border workers from next Saturday, the 20th of February. Germany has decided to ban travel from the Czech Republic and Austria over the surge of infections in more contagious variants. Over in France, the British variant of COVID-19 now accounts for almost a quarter of all new infections. Pakistan has approved China's CanSino bio vaccine for emergency use against COVID-19. Pakistan is the second nation after Mexico to approve the vaccine. The country has already approved Chinese Sinopharm and Oxford's AstraZeneca vaccines. Health Minister Faisal Sultan said the country could receive up to tens of millions of doses. Pakistan has registered 33 deaths from COVID-19, pushing the toll to 12,218. In the past 24 hours, the health ministry recorded 1,270 new infections. The ministry added that over 518,000 people have recovered from the disease so far. Pakistan's Naval Chief Admiral Mohammad Amjad Khan Niazi says the UN exercise will help improve maritime security in the region. He said this in his virtual message at a ceremony to commence the multinational level exercise at the Pakistan Navy dockyard in Karachi. Niazi highlighted the Pakistan Navy's efforts to fulfill international obligations besides protecting national interests in the Indian Ocean. Meanwhile, Commander Pakistan Fleet Rear Admiral Navid Ashra praised the participating countries for their support towards Pakistan's quest for peace at sea. Up to 45 countries are taking part in the UMN exercise which will continue till 16th of February. The opening of the exercise was marked with hoisting of flags of all the participating nations. Senior military representatives from participating countries, observers, diplomats and Pakistan Navy officials attended the ceremony. Kyrgyzstan's ambassador to Pakistan, Eric Baishambayev, says the country wants to strengthen its deep socio-cultural ties with Islamabad. He was exclusively talking to Indies News after delivering a lecture at the center of Pakistan and international relations in Islamabad. He highlighted the prominence of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor and CASA 1000 project in boosting relations between Pakistan and Kyrgyzstan. He also stressed the need of enhancing cooperation in different sectors, including trade, education and sports. We can uh, have our relation all uh, sphere, not only trade, economical, but also for the scientists, uh, educational, culture, sports activity. You know, uh, for the uh, trade and economical activity, we uh, need to promote more our uh, quadrilateral transit transport agreement, which uh, uh, using by the CPEC, you know, uh, from Gwadar to Kashgar. And then after Kashgar, you can come easily to my country and then to our all Central Asian countries, even to the Euro-Asian Economic Union up to uh, Belarus. So uh, I invite all business community to come to Kyrgyzstan and um, have uh, uh, set up the joint venture or 100% Pakistani uh, entrepreneurs and uh, for our uh, activities. Uh, also, uh, as you know, we are a member uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization and on the frame all our all of these countries, uh, we can boost these activities. Uh, not only between our both countries, but for all uh, members of uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. I do hope 
this year after the corona we can uh, be uh, more active uh, for all our uh, countries Zada Naim, a student from Pakistan, has been declared the Global Prize winner for scoring highest marks in an ACCA exam. She scored the marks in the financial reporting exam conducted in December 2020. Zada gave the credit of her achievement to her father. The ACCA qualification is considered the gold standard in accountancy with a recognition and presence in over 179 countries. The Lunar New Year has begun in Asian countries like China, South Korea and Vietnam to mark the first new moon of the lunisolar calendars. According to the Chinese zodiac, this is the year of the ox, bidding farewell to the year of the rat. More in this report. The 15 days of festivities begin with a reunion family feast of traditional food on New Year's Eve and culminate with the Lantern Festival. People gift each other money wrapped in red envelopes which signifies the arrival of good luck. Streets of several cities have been adorned with colorful in-season flowers to welcome the Chinese New Year. This show has a history of more than 100 years. We must continue to pass it on and we shall never lose it. This year's festivities are held in accordance with strict coronavirus measures to contain its dispersion. China has discouraged holiday travel after recent outbreaks forced widespread testing and quarantine requirements. I am thinking of my family. That is, I do miss home quite a lot. But on the other hand, we have to think of everyone during the pandemic. This is understandable, so I decided not to go back this time. As it waves goodbye to the year of the rat and welcomes in the year of the ox, China has largely brought the virus under control. Pakistan has sent festive greetings to Chinese people in celebration of the Lunar New Year and hailed Beijing's support amid the pandemic. It's time for a short break. We'll be back with more stories. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Amid lockdowns due to the coronavirus pandemic all across the world, big crowds and street parades are banned this carnival season. But a DJ in German city of Bonn is bringing the party right to the people's doorsteps. This report has more. DJ Ralph Noon's campaign is known simply as Crazy on Tour. The musician drives from house to house through the city streets and performs for residents for a short period. To achieve the goal of bringing people closer to the party atmosphere, Ralph converted his van into a carnival unit. We don't have carnival in the Rhineland, so we thought about what we could do to bring the carnival a bit closer to the people. And then it occurred to me that I have a van parked in front of my house that hasn't actually been used all year. So we converted it into a small, how should I put it, a carnival unit and bring the carnival to the people on their doorsteps, guerrilla style. Ralph says since this year's carnival was called off, the idea came out of necessity. The moment he presses play, it takes very little for people to come out onto the streets and dance. Unusual times call for unusual actions. I would say Corona compliant. Corona compliant, everyone is watching and everyone is in a fun mood. That's what you need these days. The carnival DJ charges only $80 to go to anyone's home to play music for 30 minutes. He has already received 20 bookings this season so far and is ready to bring good vibes amid the doom and gloom of COVID-19. And now the business updates. Britain's economy has suffered the biggest annual fall in output since modern records began. Official data shows the economy is set to shrink sharply in early 2021 again due to a third COVID-19 lockdown. The figures showed that Britain's coronavirus ravaged economy shrank 9.9% in 2020. The numbers, however, showed that the economy avoided heading back towards recession in the final quarter of the year. They reveal the country's GDP grew 1% between October and December versus the previous quarter. 
Britain has severed the highest coronavirus death toll in Europe. It reimposed a lockdown to stop the spread of the virus, dealing a blow to its industry. The European Union says it is ready to work to resolve its trade dispute with the United States. A spokesperson for the bloc also hailed President Joe Biden's decision to refrain from imposing additional tariffs on EU goods. This comes after U.S. trade officials say they are looking forward to working with the European allies to resolve all disputes. The two sides also engaged in a long-running battle over subsidies provided to Europe's Airbus and its U.S. rival Boeing. U.S. stocks have edged lower at open as Wall Street's strong momentum to start a February fizzled. The Dow Jones Industrial Average dipped marginally, while the S&P 500 is trading lower fractionally. The Nasdaq Composite is also trading lower by about a quarter of a percent. Meanwhile, oil prices fell for a second day, extending losses after OPEC cut its demand forecast, while the international energy agencies said the market was still oversupplied. Another weather situation from around the globe. And that's all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Indestock News.